So I'm really pleased this week to be able to introduce to you and host Brett Kugelmas uh, from the Energy Impact Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, for those of you uh, that might have come across Brett, you probably came across him via the Titans of Nuclear podcast. Uh, he is the creator and he was the, the host of that for many years. Um, last spring, he came over and talked to four of our faculty. So four of our faculty are official titans of nuclear. Um, but the reason I think this you'll find this talk interesting, and Brett will explain his background, he doesn't come from nuclear. Right? He was a mechanical engineer, he worked in drones and other things, but he decided he was going to think about climate, and therefore he started studying nuclear, and he studies us. And he comes to maybe very different conclusions than our internal conversations that I find quite fascinating and sometimes a little bit embarrassingly revealing when I think about the way we talk about ourselves. So it may challenge you a little bit, but I think that's good. And um, you know, he's a friend of the department and uh, I don't know why it's a great guy. I'm really glad you can be here. So Brett, thanks. Thanks guys, it's awesome to be back here. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to interact with all of you as well. Um, I'm going to give a talk for about 30 minutes, we'll have some time for Q&A, we've got a special announcement as well. So let's begin. Pop quiz for the audience. What would happen if we got to zero new emissions? Zero in every sector globally across the world. Right, so zero in industry, heat, transportation, electricity, everything. Would the climate get better, worse, or stay the same? And we're gonna have everyone raise their hands for each one of these, okay? So who thinks that it would get better? No one. Who thinks it would get worse? Okay, who thinks it would stay the same? Okay, split equally almost, wow. So uh, before I reveal which is correct, you do know that means that no matter what the right answer is, two thirds of you are wrong, right? <laughs> okay, so although commonly assumed, going net zero does not leave us at the same temperature that we are at today. It leaves us at the same rate of adding heat that we are at today about three watts per square meter radiative forcing. In mechanical terms, greenhouse gases act as a valve, not a sponge. I'm gonna use an analogy here just to make this point crystal clear. If you're driving towards a cliff at 30 miles per hour, getting to zero new emissions is not stopping the car. Getting to zero new emissions is continuing at 30 miles per hour, okay? Doing nothing at all and continuing to add emissions would be going 30.4 miles an hour one year, then 30.8 miles an hour next year, then 31.2, okay, in this analogy. It is slightly worse, but as a society, when we are about to make decisions to the tunes of tens of trillions of dollars, we should probably acknowledge the fact that getting to zero or doing nothing at all gets us to exactly the same place at almost the same time. Virtually all discussion in the media, the papers from policy wonks, everything you hear from environmental groups, politicians, clean energy startups, it's all to solve the wrong problem. Getting to zero new emissions will have virtually no effect. So if this is the wrong problem, what is the right problem then? Well, to avoid further warming, and this is to say nothing of tackling the temperature rise that we've already experienced. To avoid further warming, we need to get the atmosphere back to a state of radiative balance, a little less than 300 parts per million CO2, which means we need to remove roughly one trillion tons of carbon from the atmosphere and counting. Now, if there's one thing that I can guarantee, removing that much CO2, removing a trillion tons of anything, and hell, given how dilute CO2 is in the atmosphere, quadrillion tons of stuff, that is going to take a lot of energy. 
And all of that energy, by definition, since every energy source has a carbon footprint, just how much energy is super critical here, okay? So here's our governing rule for any approach to solving climate change. Your entire capture system must permanently store more carbon than is emitted in its production and the production of the energy source that it utilizes. Now, when I left my life in Silicon Valley, it was to base a company, the organization Energy Impact Center, on this very premise, to discover the subset of solutions that could actually make a difference, that could actually go negative, that could actually solve climate change. You see, if you're not going negative, even if your favorite energy solution replaces a worse energy source, you're not making things better. You're still adding carbon to the air, which further increases the rate of heat addition. It's like punching a small hole into a sinking ship and then patting yourself on the back because you didn't punch a big hole. Low carbon energy does not fix the problem. Only extremely low carbon energy even has a chance. And before I get into which solutions can go negative, and I promise that's coming, we're gonna discuss one more problem that the climate change discussion has fundamentally wrong as well. The real role that energy plays for most of the world. Although we don't perceive energy directly very much throughout the day, it's far more than just gasoline and leaving the lights on longer. Energy is embedded in food, in medicine, in buildings. Energy moves goods and people across the globe. Energy is in everything that you need, and energy is at the core of what you love about a prosperous world. Restricting energy, on the other hand, with higher costs, means real hardship is spread throughout every part of life. The poorer you are, the worse it hurts. This is why we decide to subsidize all types of energy, including dirty ones, as the benefits from inexpensive power have a truly profound positive impact on quality of life. For most of the world, especially the poorest, less access to energy could actually hurt them more than climate change would. And they would feel it immediately, every day, in everything that they do. Let's observe a very similar trade-off regarding energy that humanity has already made. We knowingly continue to pollute the air with particulate, causing millions of cancers and asthmas every year just to receive slightly cheaper energy. We have had the medical reasons and technology to replace coal for over half a century. But only one thing ever has, another cheaper form of power. Do we really expect a worldwide consensus on sacrifice now? across all age, class, and creed, to combat a threat distant in time and place? What the climate elite ignore is that for anyone except the absolute wealthiest, electing for more expensive energy isn't even a consideration. One more constraint for our solution too, since I know it'll come up. Our solution must not induce rapid changes to precipitation patterns. To many of the poorest on this planet, this would accelerate the worst possible outcome. We have over 2 billion people who do not have the agricultural know-how, infrastructure, or capital in place to adapt their food production to any sudden changes, and they would be forced to abandon their homes with just a few years of slightly abnormal rainfall. So unfortunately, this pretty much rules out the quick and cheap geoengineering fix of reflecting sunlight. Even if it would have a long-term positive effect on crop growth, regional changes to expected water too little or too much can instantly send millions into starvation and relocation. Or worse, as we've seen in Syria and Central America, dire civil conflict. 
Okay, I promised a solution, right? Let's derive one from first principles. If your mathematical imperative is that we must account for previous emissions, and our societal bounding condition is that we must do so in a way that doesn't impose an economic burden, then we must take the very things that require energy and result in the release of carbon dioxide and force them by definition to capture and sequester carbon dioxide. In other words, we need to make fuels and products with hydrocarbons just as we do today but with hydrogen and carbon from the air instead of from the ground. In this scenario, nothing downstream, not behavior or infrastructure needs to change. And energy consumption all of a sudden has the exact opposite effect on climate. If you use carbon from the air, the more people consume, the more prosperity we enable, the faster we will solve climate change. If you want to actually solve this problem and do so in a matter of years, not just decades, you just need to make carbon negative fuels and products cheaper than carbon positive fuels and products. This is a complete alignment of individual behavior, market forces, environmental health, and human well being. But to do so requires extreme energy abundance and an extremely low carbon footprint. It's a high bar to meet. But when I started the Energy Impact Center just two years ago, we ran this calculation for every known technology and found only one source that even came close to meeting these requirements. I don't have to tell you guys this, but not only is uranium an order of magnitude more abundant, but it has six orders of magnitude the energy density of fossil fuels. Three million times as much energy. And in order to solve climate change, all nuclear power has to do is produce heat just three times as cheap. In the last two years, my organization has interviewed over 1,500 experts across technology, industry, economics, policy, regulations, and more, to figure out why this hasn't happened yet, and what would it take to make this a reality. In that time, I've personally done over 100 site visits to research centers, power plants, universities, <coughs> conferences in over a dozen countries, and I've asked over 10,000 questions along the way. This is all documented on the Titans of Nuclear podcast, and I welcome you to join us in this process of discovery if you're not already part of our audience. I will now give you a summary of what I've learned over the last two years, and we'll wrap up with a plan to get out of this mess. Okay, so what's stopping us from deploying this incredibly powerful technology? There is one problem, and only one problem with nuclear, and that is building and operating new nuclear plants costs too much. Now, before you raise your hand about public perception being a challenge, the facts simply don't support it. Orders dried up in 1978, before Three Mile Island, because nuclear was too expensive. Orders dried up in 2008, before Fukushima, because nuclear was too expensive. Dozens of countries right now are desperate to build nuclear, but nuclear is too expensive. Public perception is a self-defeating excuse that nuclear engineers use for not building a cost-competitive product. We don't sell EPRs and AP1000s for the same reason we don't sell Segways. Overengineering has priced it out of the market. If we come up with a cheaper energy product, no matter what the critics say, the world will rationalize buying it, just like they rationalize buying clean coal. 
natural gas, or toxic solar panels. The price of a modern nuclear plant is not driven by complexity inherent to the power source, but rather accumulation of bad decisions that drive up cost, scare the public, and yet stubbornly maintain industry-wide support. My team has spent the last two years compiling dozens, but let's start with four examples. One, large construction sites. I almost couldn't believe it when last month I saw Vogel bragging about having 8,000 construction workers on site. Yes, more jobs are great, but what you want is 8,000 people spread across eight different reactors they're building with a thousand people each. Make a cheaper product and you'll drive job growth by selling more of them. Vogel's construction design choices have guaranteed there will never be another gigawatt scale nuclear plant built on American soil again. It's bad engineering. Number two. Forged pressure vessels. Does anyone know why the industry required forged pressure vessels? We didn't used to. Out of curiosity, I called up a few manufacturers to understand the difference between welding and forging. It was 1.5 versus 150 million. A hundredfold. The roots of this requirement come from experiencing radiation-induced embrittlement of the weld fill material, which in the 1960s contained copper. Well, guess what? We have new weld filler materials now, and we have processes that don't require weld filler materials at all. A good engineer does not design the strongest possible equipment. They design the cheapest possible equipment that meets strength requirements. To stick with forgings is emblematic of how conservatism and tradition drives bad engineering. Number three, airtight containment buildings. You guys know the difference between a hot pot and a pressure cooker? It wasn't a hot pot used at the Boston Marathon. Yet we require designing nuclear pressure cookers with hydrogen as the fuel and radionuclides as the shrapnel, increasing cost and decreasing safety. The design goal is to limit the flow of radionuclides in the case of an accident. That is antithetical to requiring the building itself to be a fixed volume in the presence of a heat source. No requirement for airtight containment buildings means no pressure buildup and no hydrogen buildup. And 99% of the source term moves just a couple feet. A few radioactive gases would escape, instantly dilute, and become a totally harmless part of our atmosphere, just like the sun creates totally harmless, radioactive carbon-14 every day. Instead of accepting a little radioactive gas escape, we create a dispersal mechanism for an otherwise non-mobile source and demand an incredibly expensive structure to facilitate this. Light water or any reactors with inherently negative neutronics do not need a containment building. They just need a building. A strong roof is both safer and a hundred times cheaper. We sit here criticizing the Fukushima operators for keeping generators in the basement when we sold them a plant that traps hydrogen. Let's take a little responsibility for our Bad engineering. Mistake number four, evacuation. As far as radioactive release goes, Fukushima was as bad as it could ever get for a light water reactor. The largest tsunami earthquake combo civilization has ever seen took out every single safety system, spilling three gigawatts worth of core melt on the floor. An expensive mess, but not a hazard if you just stay out of the room. But then our genius containment building turned the entire building into a pressure cooker and then shot out the radionuclides. 
And even then, the source charm was in such low quantities that no one was ever in any risk. A competent emergency plan shouldn't even have evacuation on the table. But what's the nuclear way? We behave as if a meltdown is the greatest possible emergency that could ever occur. And through our actions, we in fact convince the rest of the world of that. So as a response to this attitude, the Japanese government goes in and the first thing they do is unplug a thousand elderly from vital medical equipment, evacuating them from the remainder of their lives. After that, they forcibly remove 100,000 people from their home for years while they systematically destroy their land, all to clean up an insignificant amount of radioactive contamination. Chernobyl taught us exactly how much and what type of radiation causes harm. Fukushima proved that no light water reactor could ever come close in any circumstance. But instead of sticking up for ourselves and shouting from the hilltops that we should have less regulation than a campfire, we cower in fear and we invent ever more systems further driving up cost. That's bad logic, that's bad leadership, that's bad engineering. Why is this? Why are some of the smartest people that I have ever met responsible for some of the worst design choices that I've ever seen? I've got two words for you. Safety culture. As students, I'm not sure if you've been brainwashed yet, but as a working adult in nuclear land, Arguing for safety wins every argument, even if the result is less safety. Selling safety is selling fear. It scares the public. It doesn't appease them. Safety is responsible for those domes that built up explosive hydrogen. Safety is responsible for evacuations, which unlike light water reactors, do kill people. And even worse, safety is responsible for driving cost in every aspect of nuclear power, pricing it out of the market, enabling the proliferation of every other less safe energy source. If you hear your colleagues criticizing the Russians, consider this math. If we had a Chernobyl every month for the next 100 centuries, it would be safer than letting coal persist even just one more year. And we are responsible for coal by not providing society a cheaper option. When the industry says safety is our number one priority, what they mean is selling safety is their number one priority, not making the world a safer place. Increasing costs in nuclear is the equivalent of driving the public into far more hazardous alternatives. Our primary obligation to public safety should be to consider all downstream consequences of our decisions, including the hazards of non-consumption. This is the standard for designing rules in the transportation sector, in healthcare, in construction, in virtually every other industry that has some level of risk. It would be a different story if a meltdown was a uniquely hazardous threat, if it did result in millions of deaths. But we in this room all know better. The key to fulfilling our promise to the public is considering their interests with respect to all hazards they might face, not radiation. Let's summarize. In order to stop climate change, we need to remove 1,000 gigatons of CO2 in a way that doesn't require sacrifice. To do this, we need carbon negative fuels and products that are cheaper than carbon positive fuels and products. And to do this, we need to make nuclear 
10 times cheaper than it is today. How? Million dollar question, right? Okay, number one, hire competent construction managers. Even with all the nuclear specific constraints, it has such an overwhelming advantage from a fuel perspective, better project management alone would make it more cost competitive. Build the plants smaller and faster, borrow less money for shorter construction periods, and it'll be the cheapest power on planet Earth, like it once was. Number two, regulate for overall public safety, not just radiation. Excessive radiation protection adds tremendous direct and operational costs to every aspect of a nuclear power plant. It comes to almost $10 billion over the lifetime of each plant. And despite this fact, Every year, we continue to increase control over radiation. Crazy. Even though it's regulated at levels 10,000 times lower than anyone has ever been hurt by it. Number three. Yeah, I like this one. Engage the fossil industry to kick off a development spray. They know better than anyone how to construct large buildings with pipes in them. They have access to the capital, political relationships, and the customers. Once we build nuclear with direct air capture for them, all they need to start doing is pumping fuels from the air instead of from the ground. And nothing else about their business model needs to change. If the world builds the equivalent of 40,000 1960s, gigawatt scale light water reactors, we can capture a thousand gigatons of CO2 and create roughly $500 trillion of carbon negative fuels and products along the way. That might seem like a high number, but it's not. The energy industry is already $6 trillion a year. And so just over 20 years, it would be the equivalent of quadrupling its market size, which we should be eager to do to bring 3 billion people out of poverty. With this vision in hand, I now leave the future of our planet to the incredible talent within this room. I implore you, rise above the norms that shackle our industry. Shed the defensive posture that our colleagues adorn and wear the title of nuclear engineer with the pride that it deserves. You here are the masters of the magic within the atom. You alone hold the keys to saving the world from climate change. Thank you. Now, before we transition to Q&A, I'm going to impart upon you a gift, a specific challenge to get you started on the road towards revolutionizing this sector. Now, Professor Todd Allen has been a real mentor to me throughout the exploration of the nuclear sector. And so we've been cooking up the first steps towards retooling how innovation in this industry works. And the first steps start with you right here in this room. Available to UM students and UM students only, I invite you to partake upon the world's first nuclear energy grand challenge, where the team who submits the best business plan will win $17,000. Now, inevitably, after every pro-nuclear speech I give, I'm confronted with the same question. But what do we do about the waste, Brett? Now, even though there's no <laughs> practical mechanism by which nuclear waste could ever cause harm. And even though by definition, nuclear's output would occupy orders of magnitude less space than any other energy source's waste stream. And even though lasting a million years is short compared to the duration of the radionuclides that you already possess in your body, those are not good answers to the question. Those answers, while logical, do not satisfy the public. Those answers 
do not cause one to reframe their perspective. So long as it is fundamentally categorized as a burden, there is no limit to the magnitude of harm that someone might imagine it to be. There is only one correct answer to what do we do about nuclear waste, and that is we don't have enough of it. The winner of this prize will be the team that creates the most compelling plan to productize nuclear waste, to reimagine the ways that it will be perceived as a benefit to society. Let the games begin. All right, so as promised, he looks at the world a little differently, right? Um, questions, he purposely wanted to leave some time, so folks would engage him, challenge him. If he challenged you, feel free. Okay. It seems like, as you said at the beginning, it's not a public perception issue, it's an engineering issue. But it, it, just, it seems maybe like a circular definition yeah. because that, yeah. and what Bill just said, I mean, what you're just saying right now doesn't sound like an engineering problem. It sounds like a policy problem. Like, what are engineer, nuclear engineers supposed to do about the fact that at a governmental level these regulations are being set? Like, yeah, we have to, the reason we have all the safety is because people insist on the safety in some way or another. And it, you're even arguing, like, we need to change the perception, but that means the perception is important. <sighs> Yes, and there's two ways to look at this. The first is that um, if you make it cheaper, the perception will change, okay? So it works both ways. If it's, if it's expensive and people don't want it, the perception gets worse and worse. If it's cheaper, people rationalize wanting it. And then there's a whole mechanism by which very wealthy and prosperous country, or, uh, companies can invest hundreds of millions of dollars like the oil company and coal companies do in marketing and setting up, uh, setting up ways to in getting rid of the institutions that constantly reinforce fear, right? If there was in, uh, a natural gas regulatory agency, uh, people would be a lot more afraid of it. And they went around, to, you know, went into your house and did a little inspection of your stovetop and put a sticker and said, this thing won't blow up um, in this amount of time, one in every 100,000 years, people would be a lot more afraid of natural gas too. Um, now, what can you do about it? Lobby a foreign government, lobby a foreign regulator, one that's easy to get a hold of, and change the rules, and then design a cheap nuclear plant to go with those rules. It is not enough for us to say, we are engineers, policy is not our problem. The world is our problem, okay? So find policy people to get along with and make it happen. So which country beside California is closest? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know where this is going to happen first. We're trying to figure out. Uh, we're trying to figure that out ourselves. Uh, we're going around the world. We're meeting with different regulators, different industrial leaders, different governments to see, hey, where your priorities lie. Can you buy into this fact that uh, a meltdown of a reactor is just not that big a deal, and so you should treat it with the same, um, just treat it with the same level of response that you would anything else that doesn't kill people. Um, but it's gonna take a lot of backup from uh, people with nuclear engineering degrees for us to convince foreign governments of that. So I hope you'll help us on that journey. Yeah, Annalisa. Yeah, but maybe what Malik was saying, so it's not a matter of bad engineering, right? It's just a matter of the engineering that you have to do to It's more policy and, and, and public perception and so on. You know, the engineers, you know, I mean, I don't think that the reactor is bad engineering. I would not agree on that. Westinghouse doesn't design a, a different plan for a different market. That's bad engineering. Uh, when, when GE makes a car for India, they make it less safe than a car that they make for California. Okay? Like, that is bad engineering. Not deciding to make two different products for two different markets, it's bad engineering. Um, they sh you know, Westinghouse doesn't want to make a reactor without a containment building, right? And they should. Uh, you know, tr try to convince anyone there that, that this is a good idea. Right. That's that's if they do, if they don't choose to do that, according to how I've laid this out in terms of really measuring risk against cost, I claim it's bad engineering. Smart. He's not an engineer. It's smart. They, 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 show me show me a Westinghouse design that doesn't have a containment building. Right. The engineers there have decided that it needs a containment building as well. Nice. They haven't walked out and said we are not leaving this company uh, until you go to uh, another market. 
It's all right. I mean, I wish I could tell you that sales, the sales team and marketing teams within the nuclear sector had authority over companies. It's not. It's nuclear engineers who for the last 50 years have been told, who write in their textbooks, our number one priority is safety. Uh, may I ask you a question? Uh, so several years ago, there was some uh, <coughs> lecture of uh, uh, English team. I can't remember the, the company is already closed. So it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they say that small reactors, like very small, uh, they um, said this is a future for nuclear industry. So I'm not sure about numbers, but it's extremely cheap. So um, uh, what you are saying about the uh, cost of electricity from nuclear reactors is very costly. I suppose it's just oil is too cheap right now. Uh, it's not uh, nuclear energy is very good. It is expensive. So and, yeah, I, and also I remember that in some time uh, <clears throat> somebody said that unless the oil would cost about ninety dollars. Yeah. Well, uh, you wouldn't expect any development of nuclear industry. Yeah. And I was um, looking at, you know, like for many years, and nothing happened. And suddenly, um, a Magnox starts um, doing something with the French government. You know, like, and now, as you know, all the reactors belong to French government, well, to French um, DOI, what is, how it is called. Um, so the thing is, I looked in the numbers. It's exactly ninety dollars. So <clears throat> it's all about oil prices. Even even science. The, wouldn't, yeah. Wouldn't, listen. Wouldn't. Listen. Yes. For any uh, for any uh, fossil fuel powered thermal power plant, uh, the fuel cost represents three quarters of its LCOV. Nuclear has a negligible fuel cost. Okay. So there's no possible way that oil could ever be more expensive than nuclear uh, if burned at a thermal power plant if it didn't have the additional regulations or additional requirements. Sorry. So why the United Kingdom is now building lots of reactors? Why are they building lots of reactors? Yeah. Building a couple with Chinese money where they can. Um, do, you think, do you think it is just US problem mainly? Because US is too far away from other countries to sell oil and the U.S. has oil and gas for their own goods, and the U.S. doesn't need <coughs> nuclear power. I think, listen, the problem is a global problem. Climate change gets solved if you can make a nuclear power that produces energy at $10 a megawatt hour, and that is to a new one, and that is totally within the realm of reason. There would be no other energy on the market if you could build and stand up nuclear plants quickly Big ones taking 18 months, like it takes to like a like it takes to build a big natural gas plant, and the small ones, you know, producing them off an assembly line, like you do a car, you know, a million a quarter they do, you know, Ford produces. Um, if you can uh, achieve that level, or if you can even just achieve that mindset in terms of this is how we put together a nuclear plant, then it will be so cheap. We will we wouldn't discuss other energy options, like we don't discuss breathing things other than oxygen. Yeah, but so the, the example that you made of the car, it doesn't make a very good example, right? So why can you sell a less safer car in a different country, right? It's because of this other country has a regulation that are not as strict, right? So the case of Westinghouse, I'm pretty sure that they, they could sell a reactor without the containment, they would. The problem is they have to sell a reactor that is licensable by the nuclear authority of any given yes. country, right? Yes. And right now, I mean, I don't think you can find any country yeah, there's there's a couple ways to look at that. First, when Westinghouse sold the plant, I just was just in Slovenia. When they sold their Westinghouse plant to Slovenia, there was no regulatory authority. So there's and it would operate for ten years without a regulatory authority. So there is precedent for building and operating nuclear plants without regulatory authorities at all. There are also 180 countries in this world that have the sovereign right to build nuclear if they want to, and only 40 of them even have regulatory. So there you go. You've got a market of 140. You can immediately start selling to. Well, I'm a fan of the podcast, and my question is: 
It seems like a lot of what we're up against is massive like economic and geopolitical forces. As much as I would love to be able to walk down to Washington and lobby for them to you know, let Terra Power build their plant in China, it's not exactly tenable as an undergrad. So what should people like me do to further the cause of nuclear? I guess could you yeah. I'd say start designing a cheap system. I, I want to see entrepreneurs come out of this room who build cheap PWRs without all the additional safety systems. And then go find a co-founder to go sell it across the world with you. So, yeah, so spent fuel is not a proliferation risk because it has too high a ratio of plutonium-240 to plutonium-239. Light water reactors are pretty much the perfect reactor. You don't need to reprocess and you don't need to enrich. You can have one country do all your enrichment or only the safe countries do enrichment. It's just a totally separate consideration than a power plant itself. Yeah, but I think part of the issue ends up being that even if spent fuel is not a proliferation issue, if it's perceived as a proliferation issue by powerful countries such as the United States, then there's the threat of regulations on countries that try to build uh, cheap, low regulation uh, nuclear power, sanctions, stuff like that. I mean, there's other incentives at play here on the international field that directly come from the United States. Yeah, sure it would be good to have the fossil industry on board with all of their lobbyists and ways to export products across the world. Yeah. Yeah. They, they make a very powerful partner. Yeah, Alec. Can you talk a bit more about this uh, negative emissions? Yes. Uh, because, uh, Sue, so, so I understand you were talking about carbon capture. You said turning them into fuels. Yes. Wouldn't that just release when you burn the fuel? Fu fu yeah, you're right. Fuels would be carbon neutral. Neutral. Um, and that would be to immediately neutralize the carbon effect of all of our, you know, our current sectors right now. So instantly, if you started selling carbon neutral fuels, there'd be no more emission, effective emissions from that sector. But fuels are also used to make plastics, which are carbon negative products. Um, so it goes hand in hand. So, it's, so there's some negative in producing products and producing fuels that actually just... Neutralizes. But it can immediately access standard supply chains across the world. That's right, and so you're not pissing anybody off. All right, so instead of them buying that next parcel of land that they have to explore and dig and hope that, or out in the ocean, that next $10 billion platform that they have to explore and dig and hope that something there, you say, hey, we have a different idea. Build it wherever you guys want. Build 10,000 of them in Texas, build 10,000 of them in Greenland, wherever you guys want, just start pumping fuels directly from the air. You talked about a 100-fold decrease in the amount of Cost that correct for tenfold decrease in the cost of a power plant. Yeah. And your analysis says that is achievable. Yeah. Reducing. Yeah. I'll give you. A, yeah. I'll give you a quick high level, um, uh, top level economic analysis for you. The a gigawatt coal plant costs a billion dollars to build. A gigawatt nuclear plant costs ten billion dollars to build. It is essentially the same amount of material wires, piping, control systems, so on and so forth. So yeah, we can have a tenfold decrease if we just copy the way that the coal industry builds their power plants, essentially. And that's just to get started. I mean, think of a coal plant, all the extra things that they have, the bag houses, the uh, extra systems to process. I mean, they're loading 100 cars worth of coal on every day. There's a lot of infrastructure that's built just to support that. A nuclear plant is like a steady state battery. I went over to Calvert Cliffs. They don't touch a thing for two years straight. Okay, that is a much simpler system than a coal plant. Okay, thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Sir.